Good morning everybody, uh, or good afternoon I should say, and welcome to our um, Act of Midday Prayer. Uh, it's lovely to have you joining in with us. As I say each time, it's really helpful to me if you could um, comment and um, make your presence felt, uh, just so that I know that our internet is working. We've been having a few problems with our internet recently, and so that's really helpful for me. Um, and I'm just uh, at the same time as I'm speaking to you, just seeing if uh, this has come up so that I can monitor it on my phone as well. Um, so today we're going to be looking at um, Psalm 80 and Acts, uh, mostly chapter 13, the very last verses of chapter 12. And so you might want to find um, Psalm 80 and Acts um, 12 and 13 in your Bible. Um, uh, there we go. Here we go, and I can see that's now coming up live on my phone. That's great. And then I can see the comments that you're making, and I can uh, see that um, Patrick is feeling blessed, which is great. Uh, lots to give thanks to God for, even through this uh, difficult time and lovely to hear from you too Julia and you Angela and good to welcome our friends from Arundel Baptist Church um, we don't necessarily tell one another uh, nowadays when we're connecting but um, yeah, I'm sure that they're joining us too so that's great so um, we're going to begin and we're going to begin with our usual uh, responses which if uh, you don't know if you're new for us today then I'm sure you get the hang of them and then we'll uh, turn to praise and thanksgiving and like Patrick has done maybe there are others who have things they're particularly thankful for at the moment uh, and perhaps you could uh, mention those uh, and then we can join in with thanks together I'm gathering from Angela that uh, she's finding it uh, hard to hear so I don't know why that would be necessarily. Um, I'm quite close to this, but it could be our internet. I will try my best to speak up. So, grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And I invite you to respond and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I wonder whether there are some things that you are feeling thankful for. Um, I can see Patrick giving thanks for the glorious day and the lovely weather and we can do that too. Um, uh, we can give thanks for God whose love is constant and always with us. We can give thanks for his goodness despite circumstances. We can give thanks for family and friends and those who care for us. We can give thanks for them when we're able to meet with them and thanks for them even when we can't meet with them. Let's uh, pray together as we give thanks to God. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness. We praise you for the beauty of your creation. We praise you for the beauty of this day. We praise you for the sunshine, uh, the good weather that raises our spirits. We thank you too for rainfall, for the climate of this beautiful world that is self-regulating and produces abundance. We thank you for your constant love for us, for your goodness that even in difficult circumstances, your goodness does not change and your love for us does not change. Lord, we thank you for family and friends and all the blessings that you give us. We thank you for uh, those who care for us, whether we're able to see them or not. And we give you thanks for technology that enables us to gather together, uh, even when sometimes uh, it's not perfect. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. For all these things, we give you thanks, O oh Lord. Amen. I wonder whether my internet is struggling today, and that might be the reason for the 
um, lack of volume, I will persevere and try to remember to speak up. Uh, do keep telling me uh, how it's working and whether um, it's still too quiet for you. So we're going to have a look at Psalm uh, 80. And in this psalm, the psalmist reflects on the history of Israel, reflects on the fact that the people at the time of writing are in real difficulty and trouble, going through hard times, uh, cries out to God to answer their prayers, to make it different, and wonders uh, what it is that they might have done wrong that has brought them out of God's favour. So we'll reflect on a few of those themes. But let's find Psalm 80. Hear us. Shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh, awaken your might, come and save us, restore us, O God, make your face shine on us that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will you, your anger smoulder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbours and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea, its roots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and wild animals feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine the root of your right hand, the vine that you planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. At your rebuke your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us, that we may be saved. Well, there are many times in Israel's history, as you read through the books of 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings and Chronicles, where Israel has difficult days, where they are defeated in battle, and where the promise of their beginnings seems to have gone. Most significantly of all, it happens uh, towards the end of those, encounter, those accounts when we have the story of the exile. And perhaps this psalm seems to fit with some of those accounts where we know that Jerusalem was sacked, where first the Assyrians and later the Babylonians came and defeated the Jewish nation and ravaged it. And that's some of the imagery in there as it speaks of um, Israel being like a vine and in a vineyard and the walls have broken down and the vine has been trampled on and destroyed. Um, that would fit with that picture of the um, Jerusalem being destroyed by the Babylonian army in 587. Perhaps that's where this psalm sits. But what the psalmist does is he looks back over history and says, God, you've been good to us. Maybe there are times in our lives when we go through difficult days, when we wonder why God isn't answering our prayers, when we suffer. And um, it can be good to look back, to give thanks for good times, to remember when God has blessed us, and to give thanks to God. And that's what the psalmist does. But the psalmist also brings that to God and says, God, please do that again in our time. And then there's a looking inside and saying, well, is it something I've done? You know, when we go through difficult times, it is um, not automatically or very rarely because we've done something wrong. God loves us because he loves us because he loves us. And it says um, in the Bible that many people who are faithful to God doesn't stop them having good times. And when times are good, it doesn't mean that um, God is rewarding us. And when times are difficult, it doesn't mean that God is punishing us. 
However, there can be times when we reap the consequences of wrong we've done. And so the psalmist here is reflecting on that question. Lord, what, do we, what have we done wrong? Are there things we need to change? And of course, when it came to the exile, um, that all happened because Israel had turned away from praying to God, turned away from trusting in him, turned away from following him. And there were consequences for that. And through the exile, God brought a remnant of them back to him, willing to follow him. At the end of the psalm here, there is a looking forward, a son of man who might be raised up, a son who God will raise up. And um, there's a hint of the New Testament in that, of God promising the day when Jesus will come and show us the way to live. So perhaps some thoughts for our time now as we go through difficult days in many ways. Times for us to give thanks to God for his faithfulness in the past, to trust him into the future as he has been faithful in the past and to give him praise and thanksgiving. And also in humility to ask, what can we learn through this time? Are there ways in which this pandemic has taught us to trust God in a way that we haven't trusted him so much before? Is this an opportunity for us to turn back to him um, more fully in prayer and trust? Uh, so there are some, some thoughts on Psalm 80. Uh, Margaret is wondering whether I'm a long way from the um, screen. I'm not too far away from it, so I'm hoping that it's still picking up um, what I'm saying. It could be that the internet's a little bit weak out here. Let's turn to Acts chapter 12. And we're going to read the last verse of chapter 12, uh, verse 25. And then we're going to read through chapter 13, up to verse 12. So last week we were looking at the book of the letter, St Paul's letter to the Galatians. And actually this, um, these chapters are written at a similar time to when the letter to the Galatians was written. And so it's quite uh, interesting to be able to put these two things together. These are the Luke's account in Acts and St Paul's letter to the Galatians. So chapter 12 verse 25. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They travelled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who also was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that's right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the law? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed and he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So at the beginning of those verses, Barnabas and Saul have just returned from their mission. We need to look back to Acts chapter 11 and the final verses from 19 onwards in Acts chapter 11 to remind ourselves what that mission was. And that mission had been to take a gift to the Jerusalem church, a gift from the Gentile church in Antioch to the 
Jewish church in Jerusalem because there was famine in Jerusalem. Uh, um, a gift of love from the Christian brothers and sisters who were Gentiles to the Jewish brothers and sisters. And uh, there's an interesting background to all of that. And if you read Galatians chapters 1 and 2, you can see um, what else happened in that meeting that's not recorded in Acts, but is the background to it. And a huge discussion began to happen as to the inclusion of Gentile Christians as full members of the people of God without any um, uh, caveat that they were full members of God's people. And so that's the background and Barnabas and Saul come home from that successful visit. And then it's interesting, this church at Antioch, what a, uh, an amazing uh, group of different people. What a beautiful picture of the church. Uh, there's Barnabas, who's Jewish. There's Simon, who comes from, it seems, comes from Africa. Um, there's Lucius from Cyrene. There's Manian, who was a, a member of the elite, uh, being in the court of Herod the Tetrarch. This complete mixture of cultures and backgrounds, all believers in Jesus Christ. And that's a picture of how the church can be and should be and God wants it to be. And they're worshipping together and then they get this sense that um, God is setting aside Barnabas and Saul uh, for the work that he's called them to. This is the beginning of um, the big ministry in Saul's life as uh, he goes out on his missionary journeys, the work of lifetime for which God has been preparing him. And so they set off around the Mediterranean to declare around uh, the known world of that time that Jesus Christ is King, that the kingdom has begun and calling people to be obedient to Jesus Christ. And they start with Cyprus and it's not surprising they start with Cyprus because um, Barnabas, that's his home, he comes from Cyprus and also uh, John Mark comes from Cyprus too. And John Mark's a really interesting character. He is the writer of the Gospel of Mark, we think. And so um, as they go on this journey, they have this person who uh, knows the accounts of Jesus. We think that John Mark is the one who fled uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of Jesus' arrest and left his cloak behind and fled naked into the night. Um, bring all these together, we have someone with Paul who was with Jesus. Uh, later on, in the next, um, as, the, as the story goes on, Paul and John Mark will fall out and Paul and Barnabas will fall out as a result. Um, but we find out later in Paul's letters that uh, Mark and him are reconciled and there's a whole interesting story there. It's quite interesting the change in relationship that happens between Barnabas and Saul. Um, Barnabas was the one who brought up Saul as his protege. And now their relationship is beginning to change and Saul is the one who is demonstrating leadership and leading the team uh, for this lifetime's work and Barnabas is his supporter coming along to assist him. So they go to Cyprus and they've got an amazing opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ with um, the governor of the, the proconsul of Cyprus, the Roman proconsul. What an amazing opportunity for the gospel, Sergius Paulus. But at that time, one of the people in uh, Sergius Paulus's uh, court around him, one of his re um, uh, retinue, uh, uh, is opposed to the good news being shared with um, him. Uh, he's Elimus, the sorcerer, and he tries to stop Saul sharing the good news. And um, filled with the Holy Spirit, we're told that Saul rebukes Elimus and that tells him he's going to be blind for a time. That seems quite an uncomfortable thing for us, that act of judgment there and then. But one thing I remember is that um, that is exactly what happened to Saul himself. And it was through that temporary blinding on the road to Damascus that he came to face up to his need of grace, his need of forgiveness, and the, amount, the, the depth um, to which God went to save him, the love that he had for him. And so that was the route by which Saul came to know God as his father and came to know Jesus Christ as his saviour. And perhaps that is what Paul has in mind as Elimus is temporarily losing his sight to look at what he's doing as he tries to stop Sergius Paulus um, receiving the news, the good news of Jesus. We don't know the end of the story for Elimus because Paul and um, Barnabas are soon moving on. Um, in verse 9 we find out that it was um, Saul who for the first time was known as Paul. I find that really interesting. 
that um, Paul is a Roman nickname. He's traveling in the Roman world and perhaps there's a good practical reason for him changing from his Jewish name Saul to a different name Paul and we know him as Paul. But I'm also interested that the name Paul means little. And I this to me speaks something of Paul's humility that um, Paul will go on to say in his letter to Timothy, um, this is a truth worthy of all men to know, that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul perhaps has lots of reasons for pride. He is, um, knows his scriptures thoroughly. He's a brilliant theologian. He is one of the elite in the Jewish world in terms of theology. And yet on the Damascus Road, when he hit the dust, he came to realise that he owed everything, everything he had to Jesus Christ. Um, he had been a persecutor of Jesus until he came to know him and changed. And it was through God's grace and love for him that he's able to do what he's doing. And so Paul chooses this name that doesn't mean grand or great or big. It means little. We understand from other things he says he probably was literally a little man. We understand from other things he says in his letters that he may well have had some kind of physical disability. There were reasons why people might have judged him as not impressive uh, by the standards of the world. And yet uh, Paul is willing to identify as someone who is little. Um, and through these passages we get a wonderful combination of humility and boldness. St Paul who says, I'm little, I'm nothing, I am uh, the worst of sinners, I am the one most needing of God's grace and forgiveness. And yet the boldness that says, um, God is love. God is mighty, God forgives, God is grace, um, the boldness that is able to speak directly to Elimus. And perhaps that combination is one we need. A humility that says, God, everything I have comes from you. All things come from you. And acknowledges God's love for us, his grace for us, and we depend on him in everything. A humility that recognises that. And then at the same time, a boldness because he's a good God, a loving God. God is great. By the grace of God, I am who I am. So, um, as a bit of a rambling reflection on some of those verses from Psalm 80 and from Acts chapters, uh, chapter 13, um, perhaps a reflection for us on having that combination in our lives of humility Everything we have comes from God and our boldness. He is loving and good and we long to share that message with others. So I wonder what you're thinking that you need to pray for today. Are there prayers you want to share with us? Do uh, put them in the comments and then we can pray with you and join in that prayer together. I'm going to um, be leading us in some prayers for Beirut and for Lebanon. Uh, for Mauritius where there was that oil spill praying for wisdom for our government and then thinking of those who are in need of comfort and help and healing. Also remembering uh, Chatterbox Plus happening at the end of the week for all our young people and Martha and all the team leading them for God's blessing on them. So let's pray firstly for Lebanon following that explosion last week, ripping apart the port. Before that ever happened, uh, Lebanon was faced huge challenges it is the country in the world with the highest per capita number of refugees. Uh, a country of five million people that welcomed in one and a half million refugees since 2012 uh, following the Syrian war. On top of many refugees that come from previous conflicts uh, in uh, Israel and Palestine previously and in Jordan. And so an amazing nation that has generously welcomed in people of different countries and yet is faced with huge problems and now we've had that explosion. And so let's pray for Lebanon, let's pray for Beirut, let's pray for the Christian community there that um, they may um, witness by their words and actions to the love of Jesus to their neighbours. A lot of the Christian part of the city of Beirut was affected by that blast. And let's pray for SAT7, um, a special organisation for St Peter's, it's one of our mission partners and their base is in Beirut. It was badly damaged but no one um, thankfully was killed, or some were injured. So let's pray for SAT7 as they seek to bring education to refugees and as they seek to love and care for their neighbours. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, 
we pray today for the country of Beirut, well the country of Lebanon and the city of Beirut. Lord, we pray for them following that blast last week. We pray for all who've lost homes and livelihoods and most of all loved ones, for those who are injured and grieving, for all who seek to bring healing and comfort, for all who try to rebuild. Lord, would you bless that nation that has opened its borders and welcomed the refugee and the stranger among them, at great cost to itself. Lord, would you bless them and we pray especially for Sat7, for their work amongst refugees. In the name of Jesus, faithful to him in word and action, loving and bringing education to refugees in um, refugee camps, amongst other things. Lord, bless them as they seek to love and care for their neighbours. We thank you for the financial campaign that they have begun and we ask that many would respond generously and respond at this time of crisis. Lord in your mercy hear our prayer. Heavenly Father we bring to you the nation of Mauritius following that dreadful oil spill. Lord we thank you for the beauty of that part of the world. Lord a beautiful pristine coral reefs which are now gravely endangered. Lord, we're sorry for the ways in which so often we spoil the beautiful world that you've made. Lord, we ask that you bless the work of all who seek to make good this damage. We pray that it will be swiftly um, restored. And Lord, help us in our lives to live responsibly and well, willing to make the sacrifices to care well for the beautiful world you've given us. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for our young people and we pray for Chatterbox Plus taking part, taking place over the coming days, this Friday and then into next week in a COVID safe way, distanced, um, meeting um, while separating and keeping apart from one another. Lord, we pray that you would really bless that gathering, that many would be reminded of God's love for them come to know him for the first time, or grow in their faith. Lord, would you bless Chatterbox Plus and our young people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for wisdom for all in positions of leadership, local, in the church, nationally in our government, internationally. Lord, as we seek to act wisely at this time of pandemic, would you give wisdom to decision makers? Would you help us to act responsibly as citizens? Would you help us through this time that we uh, may come to a time when we're able to cope well with the pandemic and put it behind us? Lord, we ask for your blessing on all the scientists and all who are working on vaccines and treatments. Would you bless their work? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift to you all those known to us in particular need at this time. Maybe there's somebody you know who is lonely, worried, isolated, unwell, grieving. Lift them by name to the Lord who knows them fully. Lord, we pray for your healing touch on those who are sick, your comfort for those who sorrow. And Lord, would you help us to be your voice, your hands, your feet, loving and caring for one another in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, especially at St Peter's at this time, we pray for Mark and Sue as they prepare to move on to a new job and move away from Alba. Would you bless them in these final weeks with us, these final two weeks? Would you bless them in the transition? And would you bless them in their future ministry? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
And so we bring our prayers together in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So thank you for joining us, uh, joining me today uh, for that time of midday prayer. Um, it'll be Martin and Carice from Randall Baptist Church, I think, tomorrow. And uh, we can look forward to joining together tomorrow. May God bless the rest of your day. Um, and uh, do keep praying for those issues we've raised. And uh, we ask God's blessing on Chatterbox this coming Friday and into next week. So we'll gather again tomorrow and uh, perhaps see you then. Bye bye.